So um, welcome everybody. Um, so this is our first uh, Friday seminar from the Department of Anthropology uh, in 2024. So our first speaker uh, is Professor Mei Kim. Uh, she, she is a professor from uh, the Department of GLM and also she is the Director uh, of Urban Studies in CUHK. Um, professor Ng, um, she uh, is also an Associate Director uh, in the Institute of Feature City and her um, uh, person, uh, her, her speciality is on urban planning. So she is also a member of World Town Planning Institute and the fellows uh, of the Hong Kong Institute of uh, Planners. So today she will share her research uh, on heritage and the topic is Paul Nighting Heritage Conservation of Ma On San Iron Mai Manscape. So, so let's keep our hands and uh, welcome Professor mm, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Sharon, and thanks uh, for uh, the Department of Anthropology for inviting me to share this uh, story with you. Uh, let me share my screen, the PowerPoint. All right, um, so, um, this uh, project, uh, I intend to share with you according to, uh, you know, contents like this. I will introduce a little bit of the research. It's actually an interdisciplinary project uh, supported by the Built Heritage, you know, uh, Conservation Fund. Uh, and uh, we are supposed to really look into industrial heritage conservation. So I will talk a little bit about industrial heritage conservation. As I've just said, I feel a little bit intimidated because, uh, well, I, I really love as a planner, you know, uh, we have a natural t tendency to uh, to be really interested in conservation issues, but I'm not really an expert in this area. But uh, through taking, you know, uh, conducting this research, I have learned a lot in the process. And then I will share with you uh, this story about the history of uh, the Maonshan RMI, and not just the history, but uh, not just the mine's history, but also trying to understand uh, its historical development, you know, in the environmental socioeconomic uh, context um, of it, um, in order to understand, you know, the values of conserving this landscape, you know, why it's so important uh, to conserve uh, this place. Um, is required by the project for us to identify, you know, what they call pond line plain. Uh, we, we prefer to call it landscape, but uh, well, but in order to deliver what we have promised, so uh, we'll also I will take you through how we identify a pond line plain uh, of uh, this uh, Ma Anshan area mine as well. And uh, however, uh, if we look into the conservation policy in Hong Kong, um, it's not really adequate for us to, um, you know, really conserve uh, this landscape uh, in, in a way that's uh, more desirable or more up to international standard. But nevertheless, we share with you some of our thoughts about how we can do uh, heritage conservation uh, in this landscape, followed by, uh, you know, some conclusion. All right, the project, as I've mentioned, uh, this project is uh, uh, sponsored by the Built Heritage Conservation Fund. And uh, the actual title of the project is this one, a multidimensional pond line plain approach for industrial heritage conservation of Hong Kong, a case study of Maon Shan RMI. Um, and as I've said, uh, I really have learned a lot, especially because it's a multidimensional, uh, you know, uh, pond line, plain approach and so we actually have a whole team of colleagues uh, of course uh, from uh, your field uh, you know coming rule uh, and also we have social workers we have other geographers uh, urban designers architects you know cultural geographers you know in 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 the team in order to really understand you know the process of it we also have local partners uh the lutheran church uh very important uh and also of course the roman catholic church and also a, a local organization which actually has followed the ma Anshan story for a long time and we also get a lot of help from the people 
uh, you know, who used to live, uh, you know, there, and they sh always shared with us, uh, you know, great stories about Ma On Shan. Now, this is the approach that we try, uh, you know, to uh, identify the values of this landscape. Uh, and I have to say, Sharon, you know, uh, we got inspiration from you uh, before, you know, although we didn't collaborate afterwards, but uh, in our very first meeting, I think Sharon kind of like gave a very good uh, starting point for us to really uh, think about how, you know, through this site, this Mao Shan, you know, RMI landscape, um, you know, as a starting point and, and through tracing is uh, environmental development, economic, social, cultural, religious development, we can actually in that, you know, very site, we can actually identify uh, layers and layers of local history, history of China, the history of Asia, or even the world history. It's quite amazing. And I think, you know, I think that's the beauty of really understanding a place. I mean, as an urban planner, uh, you know, I, I learned so much because it confirms uh, my sort of like advocacy of the importance of having place-based knowledge, right? That that is the starting point for us to, whether it's for conservation, for design and for planning. So, so we use this approach to try to understand uh, the values, you know, of the site so that we can sort of, you know, think of conservation strategy for, uh, for the landscape as well. All right, so this is about industrial heritage conservation. Uh, and uh, I think like uh, any heritage, uh, industrial heritage also has two sides. One is the more tangible, the other is the intangible. Uh, they are two sides of the same coin in a sense. Uh, and we understand, you know, like uh, any economic activities, most of the economic activities, they rely on natural resources. You know, again, I confirm our uh, advocacy, you know, as a planner, the importance of uh, the environment, right, for any uh, social uh, and economic development. Uh, of course, um, you know, the RMI uh, has been there for millions of years. Uh, and the question is like, why only in that window, historical, you know, time period, right, that it's being exploited? I mean, you still have millions of tons of iron ore there, but, you know, it's closed. Uh, so, so, it's, so it's not just the natural resources, it's also like the economic environment, the social environment, the technology, and also a particular, you know, historical uh, uh, period that allow uh, that history to to germinate and then to develop, and and I think you know that that is a very for Ma Anshan, that's a very interesting story. So the tangible uh, heritage here include, of course, uh, the architecture, the landscape, uh, settlements, and related uh, items, documents, and machineries. Uh, but embedded in all these are actually, you know, uh, the technical knowledge, uh, work organizations, collective memories, and also related social and cultural traditions. So, so, uh, so this um, as sort of like this approach, uh, we kind of like learn it from the Dublin uh, principles. So the Dublin principles are actually um, developed uh, by ECOMOS and also uh, the International Committee on Industrial Heritage. Uh, so they jointly uh, sort of like, you know, wrote this uh, um, set of principles. Uh, I will refer them to Dublin principles uh, for convenience. And uh, they advocate uh, you know, cannot be wrong, right? There's four stages uh, in any industrial heritage conservation. And the first step is very important, of course, is uh, about documentation. Uh, so we need to document and understand industrial, you know, heritage, uh, the cultures, the sites, the area, the structures, the landscape uh, is very important. And it's through understanding of all these different aspects that we establish you know, the values of this uh, industrial heritage. And then of course we need to protect and maintain, you know, these heritage. We do need to have uh, effective, you know, protection uh, and conservation policies, measures, uh, you know, um, et cetera, rules, regulations, in order to uh, protect all these structures, all these sites, all the, you know, uh, area and the landscape and maintain it, right? Conserve and maintain it. Uh, and uh, we don't just, you know, conserve, maintain it, put it aside. Uh, we also need to actively, proactively communicate 
you know, whether it's to the general public or the corporate sector. Uh, and in this research, I think we should also promote to the government itself uh, the values of these, uh, all these structures. I mean, you know, it, it, it's actually very rich materials for us uh, to learn many, many subjects, right? Uh, it's, it's for training professionals. It can just for general, you know, education for our students um, in all aspects. It could be history, it could be geography, it could be, you know, all kinds of, you know, subject area. So it's very important resources for our society. Okay, now, so I want to uh, talk about uh, the history and before I do it, I want to show you a very short video. If you want to uh, watch the whole one, I, 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 at the end of the presentation, I, have, I will show you the website and, uh, and a QR code and then you can actually go and, and check it out. So I stop share my PowerPoint and then I show the video. Mangon 在1949年,台山人余榮金先生的大公洋行承包了彩矿权,而戰之后,同时中国国共内战爆发,令大批难民投资香港,为矿场提供了劳动力。矿场发展初期所开发的露天彩矿场,标志住彩矿事业的起点
uh, argued, and I really agree with them, is that uh, the spirit that's uh, exhibited uh, in, in the Ar Mao and Shan RMI, uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's that Hong Kong spirit as well. So I hope uh, after the presentation, uh, you know, you will agree with me that, you know, that spirit is also something very important if we think about, you know, our city. Anyway, okay, so, uh, um, so under the sort of like, you know, um, Mount Shan, you, you actually have this iron mine, okay? So you can see from this map, uh, this is a geological map, right? As I've said, this, um, I, I, I don't think I, want, I need to explain to you the geographical kind of like, you know, formation of this uh, iron mine, but basically it's because of certain, you know, uh, the, the, the surface of certain rock, um, you know, got uh, heated in a sense to such a big extent that, you know, this magnetized iron ore, you know, was formed. And it's in this kind of shape, Right, and that's the iron mine, um, and and part of you know the iron um, uh, was exposed uh, to uh, the surface, and that's why uh, when you first started, you know, uh, you have open pit mining uh, on Mao and Shan, uh, and then of course um, uh, when the Japanese. Uh, came uh, to invest uh, in this place, you got all these underground structures. So these are these uh, sort of checker boxes. They are actually the underground structure. And this long line, you know, uh, was when they uh, figured that, you know, uh, instead of digging all the ore out and then use trucks to transfer from uh, the mountain top, so not the top, but like from the mountain areas to uh, the lower ground, uh, you know, it took a lot of energy and could be quite dangerous. So they dug a very long tunnel, it's almost like two kilometer tunnel at uh, the middle level of 110 and, and then, you know, used the train to haul all the iron mine out uh, to this, uh, you know, uh, mineral preparation plant or ore dressing plant. Uh, this actually was the first investment of the Japanese. Uh, and of course, now we have the Mile and Shan new town. I don't know how many of you are living there and whether you know the history of it, but like this was the pier, right? Uh, so it used to have a, a coastal settlement. So there, there used to be two settlements, one at the hillside and then one at the coastal areas. And that's the shape of, uh, of the iron ore. Um, so um, the orientation, you need to use a bit of imagination because for this map, north is here, but here, for this, uh, north is here, okay? Uh, the, the, the architect students uh, do not have a very strong geographical sense. So I actually asked them to do it that way, but uh, that's, that's the best they could give me. Anyway, so as I've told you, uh, this is a very special kind of iron ore. It's called magnetite uh, iron ore. Uh, it's a very, uh, it, it, you know, if you want to make a steel, uh, you do need this kind of magnetite. You need that magnetized property in order to make iron and steel. And so that's why, you know, Japan uh, uh, took, uh, you know, the iron ore. Uh, so very quickly, uh, if, you know, in just in the video, we understand that it's not just, uh, you know, the existence of iron, it's not just the uh, coming of the Japanese, you know, that made uh, these iron ore possible. That's also, you know, a, a constellation of historical, you know, uh, events and circumstances which allow uh, the iron ore, you know, to take off. Uh, in fact, uh, at the turn of the 20th of century, um, um, like Paul Chater, he actually started to uh, uh, invite uh, Australian uh, geologists to actually explore the area. And throughout the years, uh, there, there have been like efforts to really develop uh, the uh, iron uh, mine, um, including even including uh, the Japanese occupation that they did try uh, to sort of like, you know, uh, excavate iron uh, ore from uh, the sites. But uh, because of all, you know, you've got the first half cent century of the 20th century um, um, was very difficult. You know, there were two walls and then you got the Great Depression in between. And so um, it was not really uh, well developed. Um, and after the wall, we actually have, uh, you know, the mutual trust, uh, you know, uh, cup trade and trading company sorry, originally it's called Mutual Trust Company, and then the government kind of like almost sued, uh, you know, the company because they were not allowed to use the word trust. And so, uh, you know, they changed it to uh, Mutual Mining and Trading, you know, company, and we call it, you know, MMTC. 
and uh, originally, you know, it's a trading company. Why they do, you know, mining? So basically, uh, they they wanted to, uh, you know, export mine to Japan because they happen to have a branch uh, in Japan. Okay, and and that's why, uh, you know, when we heard all these uh, oral histories uh, and and the stories told um, by uh, you know people working there, um, this company, you know, uh, could uh, um, could buy some uh, second hand. And uh, sort of like military trucks uh, or related equipment, you know, to run the mine because of you know that connection. Now they wanted to export mine, so that uh, at that time the government offered, um, you know, what they call some kind of like uh, a scheme that okay, if you export, say for example, uh, a certain um, amount of. Uh, um, goods uh, to, you know, um, to Japan, for instance, uh, then you, you are allowed to also buy 40% of that amount, you know, uh, of goods uh, back to Hong Kong so that you can sell them. Or even, um, you know, for two years, they practiced it. And that po 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 perhaps, you know, um, attracted uh, MMTC to join, you know, to, uh, to export, you know, RMI so that they can do more business, right, uh, through this trading. Uh, but of course, uh, we understand, you know, as in the video uh, is mentioned, that um, there are a number of other factors which made uh, this whole thing possible. Uh, one, of course, is that after the Second World War, um, you know, we have a civil war in China and the civil war. And then eventually the setting up of the People's Republic of China kind of like, you know, um, drove a lot of people out of uh, China, not just the average folks, it's not just those people, uh, you know, uh, common people, but also capitalists and also, you know, uh, missionaries. I think at one point, well, I don't have the figure, but I think at one point, Hong Kong probably has the highest density of uh, missionaries per person, right, on the globe, because, you know, they all, the, the Communist Party, you know, drove them out. And that's why Hong Kong, you know, um, has been very blessed uh, by the presence of these people, as I will tell you about the Mao Shan story. Um, and, and of course, uh, these people, other people, common people provided uh, the, the labor force, right? And it's not just any labor force because of the defeat of uh, the Nationalist Party, uh, Kuomintang. Uh, so a lot of the army or even high ranking officials, they came to Hong Kong and some of them actually went to Ma Anshan and became miners, right? And since they, they did not speak Cantonese, um, they kind of like, some of them, of course, some of them moved on and they went to Taiwan, but some got stuck, uh, you know, on Ma Shan. We'll talk about that later on. But anyway, so this gives you some idea that, uh, uh, okay, PLC, and we understand uh, that's also early 50s, you know, seeing, okay, you've got Soviet Union and then you've got China turning socialist, uh, you know, uh, Western countries, of course, were very concerned. And so the emergence of Cold War, so originally they really would like to punish Japan. But because of this geopolitical situation, the Allied force, you know, they sort of like agreed uh, to allow Japan to, you know, to stand on its feet again, so to speak. And Japan, who used to exploit, um, you know, China's resources, could no longer go back to China. And so they had to come to, you know, Asia, other parts of Asia, Southeast Asia, to source, you know, materials for their reindustrialization. So it's all this constellation of different layers of histories, which, you know, which allow, you know, this iron ore uh, in, on Mount Shine, you know, to take off. Anyway, so here you can see uh, 1953, uh, you know, you've got this um, Naitetsu to um, mining company coming to for investment. Uh, it's actually a lot of nuances to all these stories, which I probably may not have time to really go into details because Japan actually, I mean, Mount Shine Iron Mine was really small. And um, actually, they also are not very happy with the quality. And why you need this investment uh, was because, you know, they figure that if, uh, if you know, we continue to excavate my, you know, like what MMTC has been doing, the quality will definitely not be acceptable. And that's why they need this company to come and transfer technology locally so that they could really extract, you know, uh, more 
better quality iron out of you know the ore and and that kind of like facilitated this technological transfer at that particular period of time so they came and then the first investment they made as i've said was this ore dressing plants the mineral preparation plants and then you know and then over the years until 1959 they go they that year was the closure of the open pit mining and then they went uh, completely underground and then in 1963 they already sort of like you know they dug that uh, you know um, a tunnel at the 110 level so that uh, it's easier for to transport the iron you know or uh, to the mineral dressing plants for uh, you know uh, processing and then in 1973 they also built a conveyor belt uh, from the processing plant to the pier so that uh, you know it can go directly onto the ship and then, you know, sent to, to, to send this iron to Japan. Uh, you could see that, like, if they made investment back in 1973, they probably did not um, sort of, like, expect its closure in 1976. And for a lot of reasons, uh, you know, the video mentioned about competition. We, under, we also understand in 1973, <laughs> for the students who probably don't know, you're too young to remember that, but that was, like, a a time when we have the oil crisis and so we also have you know the demise of uh, iron and steel heavy industry in Japan and they also restructure so they did not really need that much iron you know as well so so you got you know if you just look at this simple uh, you know light graph right but actually reading behind the numbers uh, and also you you, you, you see the fate of the RMI, but also a lot of, you know, um, stories uh, behind as well. So here are some photos when uh, they practice this open peat mining. You know, it's quite unthinkable, uh, you know, from today's standard, how could they sort of, you know, mine the iron and then, you know, pull them out and then uh, do all this work. Now, I mentioned about, uh, you know, missionaries being uh, driven out of China. Actually, even before, uh, you know, uh, the MMTC worked together with the Japanese, uh, three, um, you know, uh, students from the Lutheran uh, Theological School, um, you know, uh, even the, the Lutheran Theological School had to move to Hong Kong, you know, because of the situation in China. They visited Mao Shan and discovered this, you know, area where, uh, you know, you've got people already doing, you know, open peat mining and uh, those missionaries, uh, you know, see them and then they would like to stay and also, you know, go back again and again first, you know, uh, to serve them, right, to lead them to, uh, to understand the truth, etc. And then uh, very quickly, you have, we have, you know, uh, again, the Roman Catholic Church coming is basically the, um, you know, the, San, uh, the, the Francescan brothers who came here. And again, they also uh, would like to serve the poor people there, right? A church at th those times are very, uh, you know, close to those who really need uh, their help. Up. And, and so the, the Roman Catholic Church also, you know, uh, went there at the time when you also have this, you know, uh, mutual agreement between MMTC and the um, Tichu um, Mining Company. Uh, and I've mentioned about the Cold War and the airline force, you know, trying to allow Japan to re-industrialize, you know, so that they can help to compact um, come back to the, the Cold War situation. Now that, um, you know, the Japanese investment is uh, very important. It's kind of like a transnational uh, investment. You can see it and it has kind of like helped uh, MMTC because it was only a trading company. But with the, the Japanese investment, it helped to set up sort of like a more organized uh, company structure, uh, you know, uh, under MMTC uh, with different sections or dressing, transport, laboratory, trans uh, you know, this is another, you know, um, transport section. Um, you know, these two are sort of, you know, um, one is perhaps more about uh, really transporting uh, the iron ore, the other is really about uh, internal because it's, it has to go from the mountain and the coastal areas and then the electromechanical team that works, uh, that you need a lot of 
this kind of work inside the mine. And of course, uh, civil engineering very important as well. And the mining team, now the mining team is a little bit interesting because it's the mining team which actually, um, you know, you can imagine this one company, two systems. Uh, you've got this formal organization, but then you also have subcontracting. Uh, this mining sub team, basically, you know, here, uh, if you can read Chinese, which says uh, Ma Anshan, uh, Hubei, you know, uh, you know, those from Hubei, they have a, a sort of like a, a association here. Um, so basically what uh, uh, they, they do or what they did was, uh, so you will have a head, like a team head, you know, head of a team. And then this guy, almost like a subcontractor, and he would sort of like find uh, his uh, workers, right? And he would be, he would be uh, you know, almost like a boss for these team of workers. And, they, and he would take care of their everything, basically. He paid their salary, uh, take care of the accommodation, provide them with food. It's not easy in a sense, you know, but that's how uh, this, you have these various teams and these various teams work with this, this company, uh, you know, uh, so they, they were the miners. And as I've said, uh, this, some of these miners, they actually are from the northern part of China. They could not speak Cantonese. And so in a sense, they were kind of like, you know, got stuck into this kind of work, you know, unless they, you know, for those who are higher rank, you know, maybe eventually some of them actually went to Taiwan, but otherwise many of them, you know, had to stay on the mountain in a sense. All right, so this is the overdressing plants built by the Japanese uh, investment. And uh, so it's, it's a very interesting one. Uh, it, it, you know, of course, uh, the whole mining operation, as I will mention later on, um, it actually had environmental impacts, but because it's a magnetized iron uh, ores, and so, so they, didn't, they, they, they didn't need any chemical uh, to do the processing. So basically what they, uh, you know, need to do is like they crush it and then they grind it and they grind it and when it became powder then they can use magnet to attract, you know, the iron out. So it's a, it's a, a mechanical process. Uh, it didn't really involve a chemical, thank goodness, you know, otherwise uh, we probably would have a larger environmental, you know, pollution problems and then they, you know, uh, will store it and then when the ship came they would sort of like, you know, send it out to Japan. So, um, so we could see, you could, you could kind of like understand that there are two stages in terms of technology. The first one was not, not much technology, it's basically open peat mining. But then, you know, after uh, the Japanese investment, they started to do underground mining, uh, you know, through, uh, of course, you've got these, uh, you know, the tunnels, uh, they've got the stooping, they call it stooping, uh, as, you know, uh, finding the underground and, uh, you know, almost like, you know, a, dividing them into rooms, you blast it, you, you, you empty, you know, uh, the mine and then you go to the next room and blast it in and then, you know, get it out, uh, you know, and then use a uh, locomotive or a train to uh, haul things up and you need a lot of drilling and blasting and of course you need the dressing pond, the old dressing pond to take care of the whole process. So this is uh, another, you know, way of understanding it, right? So now if you do it these days, I think uh, what uh, they would do is that they always will fill back this void uh, so that uh, it will help to stabilize, uh, you know, um, um, these, uh, these voids, right? Uh, stabilize the geology. But uh, in those years, I think uh, they didn't do it. Um, you know, so you so there are lots of, you know, uh, underground holes or cavities, uh, you know, in, in underground, uh, under the mine. Uh, and I, as I've said, um, after, you know, um, um, 10 years, less than 10 years, they discovered that maybe what they need to do is to have all these shops where they can actually, uh, you know, uh, um, sleep the, the, uh, the iron ore to uh, the 110 level so that the train can hold them up so it, to save all the ground transportation. So these give you some ideas about the inside. I, I've never entered into it. It's not allowed and now it's all, you know, barred. But actually some, uh, you know, uh, some people defined uh, the rule and regulation and did go, go into it. But I, I don't think it's a very good uh, 
we should not do it. Anyway, so these are the architecture and the relics of, uh, you know, of the RMI, which include, of course, uh, the entrances. Uh, this one is at the 240 um, meter level. Um, actually, uh, they built two uh, 240 meter level, but the first one was covered under landslide and is, you could not find it now. But uh, this one could still you know, be seen. All right, and uh, now it's all barred, right? I think people kind of like go around, and there's a circle there, so like a hole there, and people kind of like slipped into through that. Oh, don't, don't, don't tell others that I told you this. But anyway, so this is uh, the 110 uh, meter level tunnel. It's, um, you know, this condition has deteriorated, you know, we, we, uh, this project lasted for two years, and it's really sad to see this, uh, you know, it's not really well taken care of. And this is the mineral preparation plant. Um, I think you don't really see that many now, it's even worse. So if, if no one told you, uh, you probably could not recognize it because you need to really go down a bit of the slope and then, you know, before you can see it. Uh, if you've been to Maoshan, uh, there's a minibus that go to Maoshan and the last stop, you probably would be able to see this one. It's being uh, surrounded by an iron fence. It used to be the canteen and granary of, uh, you know, of the MMTC. Um, and this is the sort of like uh, mechanical section. Uh, this one uh, was uh, built um, lower down, not on the sort of mountain top. Wow, I have some music. Uh. <laughs> okay, um, so uh, they it's built down there because uh, in the past when they uh, did the open pit mining and they dumped uh, the waste, uh, you know, on the side. And then uh, when they learned the uh, new uh, technology, they thought that, wow, you know, even those waste dumps uh, still could be, have uh, economic value and could be fur further processed. And so they built the second uh, plant in order to, uh, you know, uh, extract uh, the iron from that waste dump. And this is the uh, office and also the staff dormitory. Uh, recently, when we were there, it seems like someone has occupied, have occupied them. So I don't know um, what they are doing. So um, that's, uh, that, that's uh, something we can see. And also, um, there's also this uh, explosives, uh, you know, storeroom that we could still see. Okay, so um, I think I missed out one thing, which is uh, the clinic. Um, I'm sorry about that. I should have, I don't know why I didn't notice it until now. But uh, also, they also have a clinic. And today, uh, the clinic, uh, you know, is now used for uh, an OH association, you know, which uh, uh, was established, uh, um, you know, after uh, the last member of the Catholic Church uh, who. Um, you know, stayed uh, on Mao Shan. He himself was originally, uh, you know, uh, also employed uh, in the Roman Catholic Church. And uh, until he passed away, that was, you know, that OH association, uh, that association was under the Roman Catholic Church. But after he passed away, it's being now called, you know, the Mao Shan OH association. Uh, and, uh, you know, they use that uh, clinic, you know, for their uh, purpose as well. Okay, now I want to quickly take you through uh, the environmental, social, and um, you know, uh, economic uh, you know, uh, relationships, which are very interesting. I mean, as a planner, I think the Mao Shan, Mao Shan story actually uh, gives us a lot of insights about how to nurture you know, uh, settlements and communities. Um, you know, and they have um, you know, um, um, relevance even today. Okay, now, as I've mentioned, uh, they did bring a lot of, you know, mining, uh, uh, lots of environmental impacts. Uh, before, uh, you know, you have this mining settlement, Mao Shan was uh, inhabited by uh, uh, an indigenous Hakka village, which is called uh, the Ban village. And they practiced farming and fishing and had a very, you know, sedentary, a very, you know, tra tranquil kind of lifestyle. Uh, but then, of course, you have this, uh, you know, mining, uh, open pit mining, 
have you know created a lot of waste dumps, you know, affecting their fields. Uh, underground was even worse, as uh, you could imagine, right? That uh, because they do a lot of blasting and bombing, and and really, you know, uh, they they complained a lot throughout its operation. And also because of you know I mentioned about uh, the stooping activities, and then you know because of the hollowing of uh, you know of the ground, and then it really disturbed the sort of like the geological geographical structure and has led to numerous you know landslides. Uh, you can still see some of the problems and, uh, you know, slides uh, in, in the sites. And as I've mentioned, economically, uh, because of competition, uh, you know, the iron mine uh, has to be closed uh, back in 1976. Now, um, so these uh, two uh, diagrams, um, this one represent what happened, uh, you know, uh, here, right? Um, on the hillside, right? Uh, these are two uh, interesting, two markets, you can say. This is more like a market street. This is really a, a real market. Uh, but this is, uh, you know, you can see uh, it's uh, at the coastal area, which is now buried under uh, Mao and Shan. But if you really want to learn more about like, you know, the formation of this market and how vibrant, you know, it once was, uh, you can read uh, a book uh, published by my colleague, uh, whose name is uh, Joanna Lee. Uh, together, you know, with a bunch of, uh, uh, you know, fans of Mao and Shan, and then, you know, they produce this marvelous uh, book, which try to, uh, you know, map uh, the, the market at the coastal area, you know, through uh, talking to ver various uh, previous uh, residents. Um, if you if you imagine, like, you know, I think at this height of this uh, settlement, uh, it's a few, it's several thousand people, but you can support two. Uh, two markets, right? Um, and, and it kind of like tells you like how wonderful it would be if you just allow people to use the space and think of ways to make their own life better, right? Uh, that, that will, you know, make life so, you know, so, so much different. So this is uh, the one that, uh, of course, it were the market, the market street kind of like uh, became uh, uh, sort of, I, I don't want to use the word die, but it actually, uh, you know, was not as vibrant once uh, they started to do underground and then eventually, uh, you know, uh, of, of uh, you know, um, uh, uh, slipping the, the coal mine to uh, the underground tunnel, uh, then you, then people tend to live more along the coast rather than, you know, uh, uh, to live in, in the uh, hill area, you know. So you do have these economic activities uh, filter into all these kind of like socioeconomic activities as well. But once upon a time, uh, you could not believe it. There's a, you know, eateries, a street full of eateries, right? And then with uh, all sorts of cuisines from different parts of China, because, you know, you've got people from different parts of China, uh, you know, living in that area and, uh, you know, their family or some of the, you know, some of, maybe some of the miners, uh, they got hurt and so they could not really go back to the mine. And so what they do is like uh, they would, uh, they would cook their local cuisines and then they would sell it, uh, you know, just try to uh, make one another's life easier, uh, you know, etc. And, and so it's, it's really, you know, amazing to, to see this. And also we were told that um, because you, you, once you have people, you know, aggregating, then obviously they do need to eat, they, you know, they, they, that is the basic, you know, human need, right? So there's a morning market, actually, we were told, right, right in front of uh, the Lutheran church. So, you know, if, if you have time to go to Manshine one day, you know, to go to that uh, street, it's so narrow, but like, you know, to imagine, exercise your, you know, imagination, you know, about life then, you know. Okay, now, so uh, basically, um, you've got this um, three sort of like set of settlements, right, even though just this mine, you know, not a particular big scale, but, you know, that's, that's how, you know, people in those days, Right? Mm. That, that you know how how you you sort of like develop your life and livelihood. You've got a livelihood there, and then you know you build a settlement surrounding it, and then it becomes you know a community, etc. Very interesting. So so the economic activities on this side, the social activity on the other side of the river. You can sort of like think it that way. So that's a, a peak district. Uh, and then the Ma'on Bridge District is almost like a spillover of the Peak District. 
And then further down, you've got this mid-level, right? This is the mid-level, the green, we try to use green. Um, and uh, it's a, a two-child community. In our research, um, I think we, we managed to get in once or twice, but then uh, I think we still need to do more research in order to understand more about this community. But if you know two-child community, people, uh, the two-child community is very cohesive. And uh, at first they also were minors, but very quickly they discovered they're very smart. They discovered that maybe, you know, uh, they, they don't need to be minors too hard. So they started to grow crops or raise pigs and then, you know, try to take care of people's, you know, uh, everyday life, okay? And because they are two child community, they work very hard together. And so it's the only community, it seems, in the Mao Shan area, which is not really penetrated by either, either the Protestant or the Catholic faith. Uh, so you can see, still see the traditional, uh, you know, deities there. So we've got the temple and et cetera, okay? And then, uh, unfortunately, um, the coastal area is all gone. And, but there is still a settlement, which is called the Sunyi San Chun uh, in Cantonese, which is a village built by the Lupin Church. Um, you can see that they, the structures, etc., are, are much more sturdy, and it's built by the Lutheran Church for the workers, uh, so that they don't need to live in, you know, frimsy and, and shabby, you know, uh, houses. Um, we interviewed a guy there and he told us that uh, after he moved in uh, in the 60s and there was like a typhoon and then because uh, he could see that a lot of these, you know, because he could see the those in the coastal area, the huts, right? And, the, and then he's, oh, you know, most of their rooftops were all blown away, but, you know, uh, we are okay, you know. So you could sort of imagine it's really hard. Uh, you know, in those days. So the St. Joseph Church, right, it used to be very big with the primary school at the back and also, you know, um, Coventry and also, you know, uh, the priest uh, lives there, etc. But it's all, uh, we were very lucky, actually. Uh, now you could not get in. We, we got um, the permission to get in because of this, uh, of this research. But uh, every time that lady you know, there's, there was a lady who's very stern and then even we, if we show her the letter, she did not allow us to go in. But we were so lucky one day that, uh, you know, we went there and it was a man because the lady was on leave and the man, uh, you know, he used to uh, have a girlfriend on Mount Sha, he told us, and then he would like, he said he would like, in order to chase this probably very pretty lady but anyways you would have the watermelon and then the rose stack on one hand and then walk all the way up to Mount Shan. so he told us a lot of great stories about you know the place and also because he saw our letter he let us in and so we took uh, you know some photographs and video uh, we're very grateful because after after that uh, you know Typhoon Mungut uh, kind of like real the, uh, the rooftop of uh, you know of uh, this, um, you know, church out. Uh, if you look at my virtual background, which is actually later on, uh, which is like my Shah, you can see, uh, you know, the church without the rooftop, very sad. So this is uh, the Lutheran church. You can see that it's not because, you know, God is p particularly, you know, uh, uh, favor the Lutheran church. It's just because uh, they didn't leave uh, the community until today uh, because uh, the Catholic church, uh, they migrated to uh, Chuan in a sense, uh, because of the new uh, recommend. Oh, no, Chuan what have I said? Sorry, Ma An Shan. And so they, they moved the church to Ma An Shan. But Lutheran Church stayed there, and then, you know, they had a revitalization project. And that's why uh, from them, we learn a lot about the problems of uh, doing this heritage conservation, you know. Mm -hmm. It's not directly industrial heritage conservation, but these two churches played a very, very important role uh, in making this otherwise very, you know, poor, marginalized community, uh, you know, very, they, they, they really have transformed the lives of many people who uh, lived there, especially the younger generations. Uh, you know, we interviewed so many, uh, you know, now of course they are now in their 50s, 60s, but they, every time when they, um, you know, mentioned, uh, if we have time, I can show you another video, um, uh, their recollection of their lives there. You could see like, you know, it, it's this, uh, this, this religious people who, who kind of like really selflessly uh, love this, these kids, right? Educate them, 
uh, take care of them, you know, uh, accompany them, um, seeing them, you know, through ups and downs, you know, and, and helping all these, you know, community members so that they can also, um, you know, do this mutual support, this mutuality. The spirit is just so strong that every time when we talk to people who had that experience, you can see their eyes twinkle because, and then they, they carry a smile on their face all the time. And I think that is something that, that we need, I think, in today's Hong Kong, you know, in a sense. Uh, we are so much, uh, you know, uh, we're so much richer and wealthier today. But then we just lack that mutuality right? That you do have people, how can you have people who, who will be so selflessly, you know, helping? And, and because of the church have the international connections, and so they can organize relief articles uh, for the local community so that these people know that they are not alone, that uh, they, you know, there are people who take care of them, people who care for them. And, and that makes, you know, their life, you know, also, it's a great relief for them, you know, um, as great comfort as well. Very important. See, oh, so this is, this is the rooftop, you know, very sad. So uh, we took this after the, uh, the typhoon. Um, and, and one of the amazing thing is that, uh, you know, some of the kids uh, who were nurtured in this environment, this is a painting done by, um, you know, a lady. If we have time to show the video, you could see her, you know, she painted this and, and she called it, you know, her childhood, you know, home. It's really amazing. Anyway, so uh, this is uh, industrial heritage conservation. That's the direction that we wanted to, uh, you know, um, find a, a way to suggest to the government how this whole landscape should be conserved. Um, so, um, in fact, uh, you know, these are already, um, these heritage um, items are being classified. Uh, these are great to um, um, heritage according to uh, uh, AMO um, and according to the government and these are grade uh, three okay so I, I think you guys know what is great two buildings of spe special merit efforts should be made to selectively preserve uh, I should have the proper definition here sorry I just excerpted a uh, grade three is buildings of some merit preservation in some form would be desirable and um, and also um, an alternative means could be considered if preservation is not practicable. Okay, great three. Okay, now uh, how we identify the plane? Um, you know, it's very difficult because um, it's not easy. But anyway, as a planner, uh, we understand that um, the planning department had um, once upon a time, you know, you can see that it's done in the early 20s. 2000s and then it didn't really update it we hope it will be updated so what they did was like they uh, they have this landscape character map produced in the early 2000s and the landscape character you know um, they are identified uh, through identifying the natural features and the human features okay and and then um, we kind of like draw this out which you can see that embed the whole iron ore and its settlements uh, and also, uh, you know, following the kind of like the natural ecosystem because of this uh, particular, this, this song, which is, you know, the settled valley landscape. So it includes four, uh, um, four uh, sort of, okay, two uh, landscape types. And then within the upper country uh, landscape, there are three types of landscapes as well, which is the upland and hillside landscape. And then it's the settled valley landscape, which is, you know, this whole, uh, you know, valley, the whole valley, which actually embeds the whole, uh, you know, uh, heritage in a sense. And then uh, because um, we have uh, the tunnel um, and also uh, the Shenyi village, so these two will be what they call the uh, peak landscape, you know, according to their classification. And then we also have one, um, especially the um, oil dressing plant, uh, which is um, under the urban fringe landscape is the residential lands uh, urban fringe landscape. So we can sort of like identify a plane for all these, uh, you know, heritage. And then uh, here is another way of presenting it. We identify 18 ponds, um, which we think are of uh, conservation values. 
And then we can link all this up together. Uh, we can actually tell many stories. Uh, you know, it, once we link this up, uh, we can actually tell not just uh, the story of industrial heritage because the country park is just right here and we can actually uh, pull in many other you know, things. We can actually um, you know, start from the new town. That's another kind of uh, story. But so, so the line, we can point them together and with this big plane. But then we also identify three clusters which can uh, you know, uh, pay more attention to in terms of conservation. Uh, one, of course, is this uh, hilltop area, the hill area. And then the second one is uh, you know, the area with uh, the tunnel, the 110 tunnel, um, the uh, uh, mineral pressurization plant, and of course, the Sunny Village. And then the third cluster would be the mid-level and also you know, this smart on bridge uh, you know, district. Okay, so that's uh, you know the starting point. But then we look into uh, Hong Kong's uh, conservation policy. I think I need to uh, um, quicken up. <laughs> okay, so we can see that uh, now we have uh, the Antiquities uh, Authority, which is um, you know the uh, development, uh, the Secretary of De for Development, and under it uh, it uh, set up the Commissioner for Heritage. Um, office and then under this commissioner you've got the AMO antiquities and monuments office and they work with the antiquities advisory board and currently uh, according to the uh, legislation we have the declared monument monument which is like uh, protected by law and then there are a uh, historic building so you can see it's very building centric uh, it's administrative measures uh, grade one two and three but they don't really have a statutory protection. So um, the current problems very quickly, uh, according to the ordinance, is that uh, it's building based, it's not site based. Uh, we, we, we wrote this and then uh, they, the government actually commented on our report uh, and said that they also did a lot of site based uh, you know, uh, work and as, such as tycoon, you know, etc. So uh, yes, they did, but uh, we are talking not about uh, individual projects, we really talking more about approach. Uh, and then the grading of historic buildings does not provide legal protection. Again, they also said, uh, oh, no, 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 according to their uh, internal guidelines, they do have uh, you know, internal mechanisms to protect these historic buildings. Uh, well, uh, but then it's not legal, it's not statutory protection, so you, you can do nothing, right, if uh, it's not properly protected. Uh, documentation, uh, we feel like it's over emphasis on the ta uh, tangible physical aspects um, and not enough for the social dimension. Hopefully this will be improved. Uh, so no, no single entity, uh, you know, having all the mandates to take care of that because the Commissioner for Heritage Conservation um, um, it's not, it, you know, it's only under, you know, one, uh, you know, uh, uh, bureau. And so it's, it's not powerful enough in a sense. And then according to our uh, interviews, it seems like uh, the current funding scheme uh, is not very, it's not too friendly if you really want to do a, a, a project involving a cluster of buildings. All right, so, so our, uh, according to what we promised in the projects, we put forward, we have to uh, give a strategy, a draft set of guidelines, um, you know, uh, to the government. So for the draft uh, guidelines for industrial heritage conservation uh, in the local context, we kind of like modeled on uh, the Dublin principles. I think that is a very good uh, document, uh, focusing on tangible and tangible aspects. Uh, we also argue that uh, it should not uh, be the business of uh, just professionals, but also the community and also, you know, stakeholder it has to be like an interdisciplinary, you know, uh, process uh, to record uh, the history and Hong Kong really need uh, uh, appropriate policies, you know, legal and administrative measures to do integrated, you know, infantries uh, and also, you know, uh, think of ways to protect this kind of conservation. Uh, uh, and conserving specific, you know, characteristics and meeting, you know, the current codes, uh, because we understand that if we all use a modern day uh, uh, built, uh, you know, uh, environment uh, uh, 
rules and regulations, uh, you, know, you do need certain kind of compromise and that needs a lot of work to work it out. Uh, and the integrity and authenticity of the site is very important and how to monitor conservation. And if we really cannot, you know, um, uh, uh, save a place, conserve a place, then we do need to have thorough uh, documentation. Now, another very important uh, aspect, uh, AMO has done a lot of work, but we hope that it can do more, not just by them, but also throughout uh, Hong Kong in different communities uh, as an invaluable source for multidimensional learning, right? Because they could be very valuable educational facilities, you know, for history, for uh, science, even for science, technical subjects, for arts, for math, etc. So um, we sort of like did a, a survey uh, and over 80% of uh, you know, those who surveyed said that it's very necessary to retain uh, the integrity of the landscape and its historical character. So it's important, I, I, we think that, uh, we think about conservation, heritage conservation of conserving the whole landscape, right? It doesn't mean that you cannot develop but, but when you develop, you need to think about this landscape. You know, anything, anything you add to this landscape, you know, you should be adding something good and, and appropriate and, and will sort of highlight, you know, the character of this landscape instead of, you know, allowing, you know, it to be destroyed. All right. So we need a holistic infantry, not just by experts, but by the lay person. So we think that AMO maybe can also can have, uh, you know, other professions going into the team and do the infantry work. Um, and I said, you know, I mentioned that we do need complete and comprehensive policy for conserving industrial heritage. Um, CHO definitely need to be upgraded so that it can have more power and more, you know, teeth in terms of rallying different policies, you know, to do conservation. Um, the landscape character map is great, but it has to be updated, maybe, you know, involving more of other government departments, you know, like, uh, you know, AFCD, etc. Um, conservation area zoning, we do need to think about it, you know, that probably would be a very important tool if we do heritage conservation. Funding, uh, can we do funding support which uh, will be more friendly to building clusters rather than just one building? Uh, and also um, resources are important. Uh, so can we set up like a sort of a more steady uh, income stream, you know, for conservation? It could be like a fund or it could be like, you know, a certain percentage of say land sales, you know, because, um, you know, let's say oh, maybe more appropriate in a sense if we think about it, right? So we use land and create this, you know, history and culture so that it's valuable, the whole city, right? And then if now the city is, uh, uh, the city, you know, becomes um, a modern one and people like to live in it. And then if you sell the land and you use part of it for conservation, I think that makes sense. And then communication, the industrial heritage sites as multidimensional learning ground, you know, for STEM, for STEAM, you know, for programs and activities. So they are important. Um, so can someone take hold of this, uh, who, who wrote this line on it? Anyway, so, uh, so we develop a vision, uh, a living museum. Uh, it's uh, a vision that's supported by, um, uh, we did a telephone survey and it's supported by a um, you know, majority of uh, you know, the colleagues there. And then, um, and basically our vision is that this site, this landscape will serve as a, a landscape to connect the past the present and the future, and to link the natural and the cultural relics, you know, on Maanshan with the new town, and as a point for everyone, anyone who visit the site, you know, that uh, they can actually reflect uh, on their uh, relationship, okay, um, of with this this, this multi-dimensional, you know, um, developments that uh, have contributed to Maanshan today. Okay, so it's like a place where we can go there and learn about all these histories and all this development and then we fact like what, what do they mean to us, okay? Now, um, as I've said, um, we've done um, a telephone uh, survey and you can see that um, most of what we are going to propose, uh, they are supported, 
by um, you know um, by um, the service. So those we we kind of like survey. Okay, now these are points of interest. Um, uh, we have, as I mentioned, we identified 18 points and we think that we can start with uh, the uh, open peat mining areas um, and for the entrance of uh, two um, 240 uh, my, uh, meters level, we could turn it into like an exhibition hall. Um, it would be great if it could actually allow people to have some experience of uh, going into uh, the mine as well. But we are not sure because we don't have the engineering uh, details and, and professional knowledge to say uh, if it's safe or not. But I think the government could definitely think about it. For the 110, uh, you know, ML, um, you know, they also could uh, turn it into something that people can go and understand how things work. Uh, there are actually some auxiliary structures on the two side and those could be used uh, for exhibition areas or for other purposes. Now this is the uh, the uh, the uh, oil addressing plants, the mineral preparation plants. If uh, you look at it from the new town, you know uh, you can see that's a, about that area. Okay, so we are thinking like if uh, that's the tunnel that comes out, and if in the old days you got the train and that go to the processing plants. Now. Um, one way what we could do is like, uh, you know, some colleagues suggested that we can actually have a platform if we don't build the old processing plants, right? But it, there's still some, uh, you know, construction uh, foundation there that we could build a platform. And then by uh, using AR, you know, um, augmented realities, maybe people could stand there and look I, I hope we don't need to cut too many trees or trim them. Uh, then you can actually see uh, the Mount Shan, you know, new town, and then see the old coastline and kind of like, um, you know, connecting to the past and understand how once upon a time people live. Uh, and then for the church, I think um, because the church area now, uh, Lutheran Church has been doing uh, revitalization work. Uh, they've done their first phase, I think they move into the second phase. And so I think a whole uh, area probably we could experiment with uh, different kinds of things like artist residents, you know, etc. You know, this is what they've been doing. They're trying to revitalize uh, the ecosystem, the ecology, uh, and also the, the community, uh, the religion religious, you know, kind of, uh, you know, work, etc. So, uh, and also we suggested that we can develop different kind of uh, heritage trails along the way, you know, and we can have, again, with, uh, you know, this kind of QR code, we can allow people to have some uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, you know, experiences, or, uh, or even use some of uh, these kind of, uh, whether it's these paintings, we also, we also have a calligraphy uh, kind of like a piece uh, by another resident. So we can use this, you know, uh, talents of uh, Mao and Shan uh, residents in the past uh, to uh, decorate and also to enrich, you know, this kind of uh, exhibits. And then we have these three clusters and the top cluster, as I've said, uh, you know, it, it needs to be, I think, well, because of its remote uh, location, hopefully uh, the development pressure was not as high. And so uh, Lutheran Church actually could be um, sort of like uh, uh, the agents there to work with other uh, stakeholders or other NGOs uh, to uh, turn it into an experimental you know, ground. Uh, it could be for people, uh, artists, for students uh, to come and also uh, to enjoy the place and also to learn about the history and also to reflect you know, uh, on uh, their relationship with all these very rich layers of history. Uh, and then, uh, then the second layer or cluster would be uh, closer to the Mount Shine New Town. We do understand that um, you know uh, it has a much higher development pressure. And so, what we tried to argue, actually, the government had a public housing estate proposal right here. Uh, very close to the, um, you know, the tunnel. And what they tried to do, and, and also a school, I think, and what they tried to do was like, they make sure that the boundary would, would never really, you know, infringe into uh, uh, the sort of like the heritage. But we think that it's not good enough, uh, you know, um, a way of handling it. Uh, as a planner, uh, if you have such a great, you know, uh, set of uh, heritage, you know, in the vicinity, 
quality of your site. So what you need to do is to design them into your development uh, and, and so that your residents, your future residents will have this great community resources, right, for them to learn and also to, you know, work from there. So we think that it's very important for any new development to design, uh, you know, in an integrated manner, you know, uh, with this heritage so that uh, you, you can take this heritage, you know, to the next level. Currently, it's just, you know, being led to the mercy of nature. Okay, and then uh, the third cluster is an area that we know the list, uh, even after two years of study. Uh, so uh, we understand that it's still an active farming community there. And we think that since these people have been living here for so long, they should have a right to continue in a way, in one way or another, their life and livelihood there. And so any new development should take that into consideration. Okay, I, sorry, I seem to be uh, talking for too much. Anyway, conclusion. Um, so um, basically this uh, RMI, a joint venture, we understand uh, and it's, you know, it's, Life will be less than a quarter of a century and it's made possible because of a constellation of factors uh, and, uh, you know, uh, Cold War, setting up PRC, Japan's reindustrialization, uh, Hong Kong's industrial takeoff, international and local growth, and also immigration, uh, you know, uh, migrants, uh, missionaries, et cetera, et cetera. And, and they come together and, and work out, you know, this wonderful story. Uh, you know, at that time. So we, because of that, you know, because of this historical uh, and also this, you know, coming together of, of all these factors which made, uh, you know, a marginalized and poor community, but having this very rich, uh, you know, social capital and collective memories, right, um, of the place. Uh, and also these kids, uh, they, they, Although they are not like, okay, some of them have higher, you know, achievements than the others, but they are all very happy when they, you know, think about, um, um, you know, Ma on Shan. And, and I feel like, you know, why they have such a healthy sort of like, you know, um, a memory of, of the place, you know, is, of course, it's because of all the social capital. But I guess the ecological capital is also very important. I mean, imagine that you live in that, you know, green uh, oxygen bar, you know, some people call it, right? So it's really, it's like uh, your greatest, you know, playground, right? It's, it's full of wonder in nature, right? Some of them say, oh, they catch a, they would catch a fish for their mom, you know, for their dinner, to add uh, things for, to their dinner, etc. So we think that it, it has great conservation values, like the relics, the, the structural, uh, cultural, religious, and social legacies and they could become invaluable educational resources. But un unfortunately, we think that the current institutional setup is not quite adequate, uh, you know, to protect this kind of, uh, you know, heritage conservation. And we, in our report, we really urge the government to really think about, you know, um, think of an appropriate set of institutions uh, so that this kind of heritage can be conserved for Hong Kongers because, you know, um, you know hopefully uh, many more generations will live, you know, um, here. Okay, now I, I, I understand that it's already- <laughs> Thank you, thank you, because you have to, uh, you have to go at uh, 2.25. So right now we uh, still have 10 minutes. Um, uh, well, uh, okay, before I, before I, uh, here is the, oops. I will have time to show you the video, but this is the website yes. and the QR code. So please uh, go to the website and you can read for yourself and watch the video for yourself. Okay. Uh, maybe you. I keep this on for a while. Uh, uh, yes, I, I also uh, passed the link. Oh, uh, great, great, great. The, okay. Uh, our department website. Okay. So, um, so right now we have two questions. Uh, I also have uh, my question I want to ask you. So the first question, oh Gordon, you, you, you asked uh, Professor Ng directly. Yeah, Gordon? Yeah, or you have some more questions you want to ask. Okay, okay Mark. Gordon cannot hear you. Yeah, your mic has some problem. <laughs> Okay, you, you can also see in the chat box. You can also see in the chat box. 
this should be very quick then. Yeah. Um, the problem that I see from the talk, it was really happy to hear about all this, is you seem to speak of natural conservation and industrial conservation as linked. And yet so many people use this area hiking. The McLeos Trail goes through here. So many other trails go through here. This is a contradiction. I mean, while I, I, I really do admire what you're doing, at the same time, I hope you fail in part because I want this area to be kept natural. I want to be able to hike through here rather than have it have too many tourists come in to look at the iron mine. I want this area to be kept natural. Is, is that a contradiction or not? Or can no. it both take place? Oh, actually it's not. Uh, actually, we do have uh, people who uh, use the trails, uh, you know, uh, in our workshops. And then they suggested that, oh, why don't you just, uh, you know, try to link this history and let us know more about what happened, you know, in surrounding places, etc. And in fact, in our recommendation to the government, the very first thing, I'm sorry, it's, you know, just have an hour to do this. Uh, we suggested that uh, they have to do a carrying capacity study uh, before, uh, you know, uh, they, they do anything. So, um, as a planner, I think we can manage. It's, it's more about management. Uh, I don't think we will destroy, uh, you know, um, that kind of activities. Yes. Okay. okay, the second question raised by Ed. Ed, are you here? Yeah, can, can you make your question a little bit short? So, uh, yeah, I, I, I can. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, it's, it's also early, so I probably sound like I haven't woke up yet. But uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's not in Hong Kong. <laughs> no, I'm in. Thank Norway. you so much. Yeah. Uh, so I was wondering if you've examined the local grassroots attempts to preserve the heritage of the uh, of the mine, um, because, for instance, like at uh, Taishui Hong uh, MTR station, there's a cafe, uh, MOS cafe. Uh, that's uh, decorated with pictures about the mine. And I was just wondering if you've thought about different ways to kind of integrate local attempts to preserve the mine. in. Yeah, your... yeah. Uh, that guy, uh, the, the owner of the cafe, uh, he's our advisor. We work okay. very closely together, yes. Yeah. And, and how, how is he, he planning to integrate uh, his, he, his... He, Well, okay, so um, is he recording? I can't tell you. Yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> no problem. I, because there are, we have different advices and then, um, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I, if no, it's recorded, okay. so maybe uh, uh, you can privately talk to me. Yeah. <laughs> no problem. Okay, yes. so time is running out. So uh, the first question from MK. MK, can you? Uh, MK asking MK. Yeah, MK asking MK. MK? Yeah, 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 peace. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sure. Yes. All right, well, thanks very much for the presentation. My question is quite um, short. Actually, uh, can you tell, tell us more about the impact uh, of iron mining? I mean, it's too great to hear a story about mining that have no negative impact to local communities, right? Can you tell, tell us something more about that? Like, oh, no, no, no. There are, I'm sorry, there are, there are negative impacts. Um, um, but as I've said, uh, because it's a magneticized, um, you know, magnetized kind of iron ore. And so the whole operation, the, the, um, the worst uh, impacts would be uh, before they had the 110ML tunnel. Uh, you've got all these, you know, trucks, you know, running down and then uh, transporting all the coal. And you could imagine that um, uh, the, the environment um, was not very nice. That's one thing. Uh, and of course, it's dangerous, um, you know, to the people, you know, as well. But they did a lot of, uh, you know, um, um, sort of like testing of the soil and also the dumping. The dumping of the waste dump uh, on the hillside actually made the soil very acidic. And that affected uh, local vegetation. You don't, you, you, you don't have that many trees. So whenever you see, uh, you know, on the hillside where you don't see many trees, you can almost like, you know, guess that, uh, that that probably was once a dumping ground. Um, but, um, but because of the um, technology, they use uh, the, the sort of like uh, that, the tunnel, etc. that actually has improved. And they also did a lot of uh, soil tests. And, and it seems like uh, that's not much, not very bad uh, kind of, you know, impacts. But the waste dumps at one point uh, was very obvious, you know. Uh, and I guess if you know, if on a dry day when you have strong winds, uh, people, people's life would be affected. But because of uh, the reclamation, they were all buried, you know, afterwards. So we could not really, well, I, 
I could not see with my eyes. Uh, I didn't have real life experience. I could only do it by documentary research. Okay, thank you, MK. So the fourth question from Tim. Tim. Lam Kai Tim. Are you here? Lam Kai Tim. Yeah. Hi, hi, uh, Tim. Yeah, please. Hello, hello, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, I would like to ask a question. Um, I go to uh, I go to tar a tour in the mountain for quite a long time ago, and the tour guide said that um, most of the work are professional uh, expert in using explosive. Oh. Uh, they're most most of them come from Kuomintang Army, and they're lower 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 to go, so they've settled down here. And every year later, when you go to Mount Shan, you see uh, the uh, university of the uh, Kuomintang is um, ten of. 10th of uh, October, uh, 10. October, yeah. And you will see the lot of fat of common dawn in, in, in blue here. And I don't, I don't know if it's true uh, or it's some, it's true. some kind of... Uh, no, no, it's true. It's, I, well, but all of them are explosive uh, masters. I don't know. But, but, but uh, yeah, it's like it just... I hope the reports that they will allow the public to read. Uh, but it's true that uh, uh, they actually nurtured, uh, you know, people who can handle explosives and they become very important when we build the MTR stations, you know, because we do a lot of underground, you know, um, uh, explosive work. So it's true that Simon Shan, uh, not only that, they actually, uh, we, we talked to some of uh, the people who work in the mine and they said, you know, uh, these other people, they, they don't have that sense of, you know, uh, alert when they work in dangerous, you know, um, situations. They're not like us, you know, we're very, you know, seasoned, kind of like we're very alert in that kind of situation. So they do nurture a generation of, uh, you know, uh, construction workers or related workers who are very mindful of uh, the possible danger. So it's true. And then for the uh, Nationalist Party uh, inference, it's very true. Uh, actually, they are not just having the flags. They will build these, uh, what they, how to call it in uh, China, uh, English, uh, so they would like have all these, you know, decoration, you know, uh, with, and then with, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, President Chang's uh, portrait, right, on it. And then they would take photos. They, it's, very, it's a very big event every, every year, you know, 10th of uh, October. And that kind of like uh, lasted probably until uh, the mine was closed. It's true. And another question, I've been to uh, the opening of um, 204 level a few years ago, but I find it's quite deteriorated. Mm. Um, I find this uh, most of most the teenager go there to play war games. Mm. Yeah, and this is not a good condition. Is there any plan to protect or um, uh, to restore the, the, the opening? Yes, this is my question. You should ask AMO, <laughs> the Development Bureau. Yeah, the, uh, Thank you, Sharon. You should yeah, talk about it. <laughs> it's the research, uh, mainly the researcher. Yeah. And uh, what, uh, Raymond, you have questions? So, very quick, because uh, making her has to leave. <laughs> yeah, I just have uh, two questions. One is uh, uh, in Hong Kong. You choose one, maybe. Okay. No, 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 it's okay. I, I already tell them that if I were later, it's because I was in the seminar. So. Oh, okay, that's great. Yeah, yeah, peace. peace. Yeah, in, in Hong Kong, actually, there were many mines, like a Super Bay mine and then a Little Hill mine. And what is the significance of the uh, Ma An San mine for, from the perspective of uh, heritage uh, conservation? And then the second question <laughs> is, uh, 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 actually, what was the attitude of the colonial government towards mining industry at that time? You mentioned, you talk about the church group and then the, com uh, the uh, community groups. And how about the, uh, uh, the role of the government? Okay, the first question. I used the whole hour to tell you and you asked me by this question. I feel very bad. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> but anyway, I think, I, I, well, as I've said, uh, this mine uh, itself, um, it, it tells you this story about uh, the exploitation of natural resources, right? How that relates to local regional and international histories, right? And it also witnessed uh, the collaboration of uh, local and Japanese investment, right? So that as uh, Carmen said, right, that allows our raw materials to enter into an international, you know, um, value chain, industrial value chain in that sense. So it's, it's, a, it's uh, in, 
I think uh, among all the other mining industries, this one is quite interesting in, in that sense with all these, you know, background. And of course, accompanying this more like related to industrial and also natural resources are the social and religious and cultural dimension, uh, which is unique, which actually um, exhibits uh, Hong Kong spirit as well. Now, colonial government, um, I think the moral is that uh, they didn't really care this marginalized community. And thank goodness that they didn't care about it. Uh, it thrived. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, okay, uh, that's an overstatement, uh, but it's true because uh, it was really uh, very in very like late late seventies or even eighties that um, I think it's in the seventies that uh, they had electricity, and then it's only when Sang Hong Kei bought uh, the land from the Wen Village that the government built uh, you know water infrastructure there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and I think as a planner, I find this idea of allowing the people to use the space and figure out ways to meet their daily needs. I think that experiment has a lot to, to offer in today's Hong Kong. Our city tends to be over-regulated, over-managed, and it's very difficult and hard for people to use space, urban spaces these days. And if you allow people to do that, you know, people will have that, you know, ingenious urge and sort of abilities to transform places into communities, you know, into places that they actually can uh, make a better living. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's something I find it very inspiring. Okay, thank you, Wyman. Um, so, Makim, uh, I just want to give you uh, an information because when I work on the community project in Lei Yun Moon, um, they also have a Korean, Korean during the 1950s to 1960s. But the problem is during 1967, you know that Hong Kong, they have right. a patriotic right, yes. And after that, the um, British colonial government banned um, uh, the whole Korean industry, they can, they no longer use the explosive. So I just wondering in the case in Mount San, because uh, this um, mining stopped at uh, 19, uh, 1976, it's around uh, the later period of cultural revolution. So I'm not sure <laughs> whether it's another uh, reason they, they banned that. This is just a comment for you. I, I really okay. want to end. I, 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 suspect, uh, I suspect that's not the case because, well, you have to appreciate like Mao Shan is actually uh, within that 1990 lease of the new territories. So the urban areas was another world for, for the people there at that time. Uh, they, they, they probably were not very concerned about the riots. Um, and in 1973, they, they continued to build that conveyor belt. It's, a, it's an investment, right? And, and so I really, I believe that at that time, they really did not expect to close the mine in three years time. Yeah. But that's, that's my guess. I, I, will, I will, if I have time, I will check it. I really want to finalize the report and send it out. And, <laughs> and uh, maybe uh, last question, because okay. why don't you share, uh, you, you have a talk in our department. So I would like to know when you work on this interdisciplinary project with anthropologists and other people in different fields, uh, what is your major challenge or interesting finding when you work with people with different backgrounds? Because I, I find in your presentation, you have a really great resource uh, interpretation on uh, space and time, and also a lot of quantitative uh, information or statistics. So what's your major findings after you finish this interdisciplinary project? So you need to find a great team. <laughs> <laughs> I really have to go. Okay. Although so I told them that I probably will be late. Thank yeah. you so much. So thank you so much. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. So, uh, uh, so if uh, you uh, so thank you for coming. So, if you have further questions uh, about this project, uh, you can send an email to Professor Makin uh, for uh, further information, and she's willing willing to share with you about uh, the story behind the scene. Yeah, because last time when I talked to her, she shared a lot of. Uh, 
things when she collaborate with uh, different people, especially anthropologists uh, and other, uh, even archaeologists. They also have uh, a team member and architect. So it's a great experience for them to have such uh, interesting uh, research projects in the, the local heritage. So thank you for coming. And uh, I, I know next seminar, uh, next Friday seminar, uh, will be held on 25th of uh, September. So welcome to join our next Friday seminar. Okay, see you later. Bye-bye.